Hello. So I've got the uh, last slot today. I'm all that's standing between you and the beer. So uh, I hope this is going to be good and keep your attention. We're talking uh, today about uh, software craftsmanship. So what do I mean by software craftsmanship? ASCII art. This is, this, is actually, this is actually an Easter egg in an HP product. I didn't know HP developers had a sense of humor. Anyway, um, so that's, that, that it could be this. Are we talking about going back to basics? Are we going to make our own tools or something like that? No, maybe not. Well, actually, but I was uh, going to go back a little bit to the Agile Manifesto, which some smart guys came up with in like 2002, I think this is a long time ago. And they had this vision for how software development was going to be different. There was going to be, uh, we were going to uncover better ways of, of building software. We, we uh, think this, this is important, but this is more important. We value this more. And, and uh, they've got all these, these statements. And with this uh, manifesto, the aim was to, to try and change the industry. And this was, so as I say, this was like quite a while ago. And these days, I think it's probably fair to say that Agile is, has uh, been adopted by a lot of people. And there's this, uh, this Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm thing, an adoption of a new technology. And I think it's fair to say that Agile has definitely crossed the chasm. And uh, the majority, the early majority, at least, definitely, is using Agile. Possibly it's reached the, the late majority. Um, so the Agile is becoming the dominant way of developing software in our industry. So uh, just going back to the manifesto, I, would, I, I think we need to have a bit of talking here. Just turn to your neighbor, spend one minute or two minutes discussing, do you think that the vision that the people who wrote the Agile Manifesto had when they wrote it, has that been realized in our industry? So you've got two minutes, discuss with your neighbor. <laughs> Okay, so you've had your uh, two, two minutes now. So um, I hope you've had some interesting discussions. And we can continue these discussions later over a beer. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, I think it sparked some discussion. Perhaps we'll continue those discussions over a beer later. Um, but I've got some things to say on this topic as well. <laughs> and since I'm the speaker, you get to listen to me. So um, I was wanted to quote Robert Martin, who was one of the original initiators of the Agile Manifesto, he says, 
the original torch of the Agile message has changed hands and is now being carried by the software craftsmanship movement. These are the folks who continue to pursue the technical excellence and professionalism that drove the original founders of the Agile movement. So this is Bob Martin, the guy who actually called the meeting where they came up with the manifesto. He's, he, this, he said this like uh, two or three years ago now, that um, it's moved on. We should be looking at craftsmanship now. And in fact, he, he had a keynote presentation uh, in 2008 where I was, was present, and he suggested that we forgot one value in the manifesto. We should have a value that said, we value craftsmanship over crap. Um, and he, he, he marched around the stage and threw his index cards, cards into the audience, and generally, uh, you know, he does that so well. Um, but anyway, he said there was a problem with this, though, that the trouble is, with the, all the other values, you know, the thing on the left um, you value more, but the thing on the right is still valuable. Whereas we don't value crap, you know. <laughs> There's no one who values that. We actually think that it's a good thing to write good software. So following that, a bunch of people uh, started a mailing list and, and they had a meeting and they said, well, let's do something about this. The Agile Manifesto is missing something here. So let's create a new manifesto. So this is how um, they announced it on this mailing list, that there was a manifesto. And they invited people to go and sign it. So if you go to that link, you come up with this page, with this, this manifesto for software craftsmanship. And uh, I'll go through this in more detail shortly. But a surprising number of people all around the world actually went on to this and signed it and said, we agree with this. This, this is like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, software developers have thought that this is a good idea. So uh, I think it might be interesting to take a closer look at this craftsmanship thing and find out, well, what, what do they say? Um, so I was going to go through the manifesto in, in some detail and try and explain it to you, because um, quite a lot of people seem to think it's important. So the first part of the software craftsmanship manifesto mirrors the first part of the Agile manifesto. It says, this is we are uncovering better ways of developing software. And this is saying, well, as aspiring software craftsmanship, we are raising the bar of professional software development by practicing and helping others to learn the craft. And through this work, we have come to value. So both of these are saying, um, we're doing this. This is based on our experience actually building software, developing software. Um, both of, of these first introductions. And then they have this thing of, uh, you know, there's value in the items on the right, we value things on the left more. The Craftsmanship Manifesto says, well, in pursuit of these things, we have found these other things indispensable. So it's, it's taken the, the four things in the Agile Manifesto that we value more and put something in front of that and said, in order to get that, you're going to need this, by the way. So um, the four things on the Agile Manifesto are individuals and interactions, and working software, customer co collaboration, responding to change. And they, they've kind of taken each of those four and, and built on it and extended it. So if we take the first one, oh, I thought I was going through each one in turn. I'll do that on this slide then. OK, so the first one is that the uh, working software isn't enough. We want well-crafted software. The next one is, is we're not only going to respond to change, which is the cust that's not the closest. That's the, uh, which one's that? The last one, yes, thank you. Responding to change, we're going to steadily add value. We're going to have software where it's not just about following whatever the customer wants. We, we want the customer to be continually able to have more value in the software. And that says something about the, how the software is built. And then the, the community, the individuals and interactions, well, that's not enough. We've got to have a whole community. And the customer collaboration, yeah, we've got to see these people as partners. I'm sure I'm going to go through this more in a minute. Um, so. Just to summarize what this is all about, it's, uh, I think th there's, they're talking about skill. They're talking about taking a long view, talking about teaching and learning and the end user. So these are the themes I'm going to take up now in more detail. Because I think 
the, the writers of the Agile Manifesto meant this, but they didn't write it down in such a way that it came across. So well-crafted software is about skill, excellence, being able to actually build software and, and in a way that's skillful. So well-crafted software is, is fit for purpose. It's software that uh, is used, the people who are using it find it useful for what they're trying to do for it, with it. Um, the code inside, when you, when you lift the, the lid and look at the code inside, it's well-crafted, it's clean code, it's well-designed, it's readable. Um, and, of course, you have comprehensive automated tests because that's part of having good software. So that's, that's important. The, the structure of the code is, is readable. And if you think about this, all of this is, in fact, from extreme programming. If you look at the, this, these things, and the, this is a picture of extreme programming that Ron Jeffries has drawn. And these things in the, right in the center of it are all the developer practices, all this about um, refactoring and test-driven development. That is really the heart, I think, of, of software craftsmanship, is remembering all these programmer um, activities that need to happen. And the rest around the outside is important too, but the craftsmanship, um, well-crafted software is reminding us about the, the XP practices in the middle there. So these days, instead of just talking about the XP practices, um, I think you talk about engineering practices. You talk about a whole, whole stack of practices you need to put in place for, for um, Agile to work, in my opinion, or for craftsmanship to be in place. So I'm, I'm going to build up a pyramid here. Of, and I think essential technical practice number one, get some version control. And um, thankfully, most people have got that these days. Version control is, is kind of a given. Um, but once you've got that, of course, you can automate your build. And you can make it possible to, to press a button or run a script and get the latest code, build it. And that's, most, a lot, most places have got that now as well. Ant has been around for a while, similar tools for, for other platforms. And then you can have continuous integration, of course, because then you can have a server that sits there and listens for changes in version control, grabs the code, builds it. And most people these days actually have in continuous integration of some form. It's not everyone's quite realized that you have to actually only have one code branch and everything integrates into that. You can't have a different branch for every project or every customer. So yeah, we're getting there on, on continuous integration. Um, and then I think it's first at that point, really, that it's worth investing a lot in automated testing and, and uh, test-driven development, um, specification by example tests, all those things. I think um, before you actually have functioning continuous integration, you won't get much benefit from adding automated tests into the mix. Um, so, but I think that's, that's good. And then I think if you've got that sorted, which actually very few people have, um, then it's worth really investing in manual testing excellence. So software craftsmanship isn't just about programmers uh, doing their job really well. It's, it's about skilled testers, um, I think. And I don't know if you know about exploratory testing. It's, it's where you take a really skilled te tester and you put them in front of your software. And they, on the fly, design test cases, execute them, learn stuff, design new test cases, execute them. And it can be a really effective way to find bugs. But if you haven't sorted out your automated tests to find all the normal kind of errors that programmers always make, they'll get bored. They'll get fed up because they'll be finding so much stuff. They won't be able to do their job. So um, I kind of see it as a progression of, of technical practices that you can put in place. So when, when I showed this before, Agile has crossed the chasm. But not all of those technical practices have, I don't think. So agile methods, of course, but continuous integration? Yeah, maybe. Automated unit tests written by developers? Well, most people are trying to write unit tests of some kind, but um, there's still a lot of stuff that's not working very well with that in the organizations that I've observed, at least. Um, and then if you have the higher levels, you know, the story tests, exploratory testing, I think there's even fewer who are really succeeding with that. So I think there's a way to go uh, on these things. 
So if you're interested in, in uh, finding out more about uh, well-crafted software, there's a, a couple of good books um, and clean code. Yeah, Bob Martin wrote that one. So there's, there's, there's literature for programmers about, about learning this stuff. Um, but that brings me on to my next section, which is about teaching and learning, which I think it comes across here in this uh, value of, we, we're not just valuing individuals and interactions in our team, we value having a community of professionals that we're all members of. So this, this value is about trust and respect for, for other professionals. That we have this idea that we should always be learning from one another and freely sharing knowledge within the community. And I think um, this community of professionals implies outside of our own organization. I don't think you can call yourself a professional if you never interact and talk and learn with people from outside your organization. This, this is a global professional community that we should think of ourselves as being members of. There's um, plenty of stuff going on in the wider community to promote um, good, good conduct. There's uh, books about becoming an apprentice and, and uh, learning the craft of software development, not just within your organization, but, but more widely, so getting yourself a mentor, uh, getting feedback. Um, I actually rather daringly added my own book to this <laughs> particular <laughs> section because um, I've written a book called The Coding Dojo Handbook, which is all about teaching and learning in a, a community or a group. So uh, I think there's, there's resources here as well. Um, because I think there's a bunch of stuff you need to, to learn. Uh, I've got this slide on practical coding skills, stuff that programmers need to learn. I've already talked about this, really, but there's all these, all these skills that, that programmers need um, to do a good job. And these things are not easy to learn. There's a, a, this is a long list. I'm not expecting you to really read these. I wanted to pick out test-driven development. <laughs> Could you guess that this was my, <laughs> this was my <laughs> no, key skill that, that I think programmers need to learn? And it's, it's not an easy skill to learn because it's a complex skill. You have to also master all of these other skills in order to do TDD effectively, in my opinion. It's a kind of a compound skill. Uh, it sits at the top of a pyramid. You have to be able to refactor. You have to be able to design test cases. You have to be able to work incrementally. You have to be able to do good object-oriented design. Otherwise, you'll fail at doing TDD. So it's, uh, I think it's a very difficult skill to learn, which brings me on to, um, I'm selling my book, by the way. Um, so uh, you could, the traditional way for programmers to learn skills is to go on a training course. You send your programmers on a two-day, maybe a week course to learn the latest framework tool, Java, object-oriented, .NET, something or other. And then they come back and, and they start using it. This in my experience, works very poorly for a skill like test-driven development, which is so complex and affects so much about the way programmers work on a minute-by-minute -minute level. Uh, it's, um, I don't recommend this. So then what I do recommend, though, is pair programming. If you can get uh, programmers to, to work together and learn from one another in, in a pair during the day while they're getting work done and being paid, this, this is great. Uh, this, this means that you are, hopefully, that the better programmers who know more of these skills are transferring that knowledge to the other programmers. And skill is, there's, there's a learning aspect to this. The thing is, this isn't always possible. There isn't always a good environment for pair programming. There isn't everyone who wants to do it. There might not be anyone on your team who, who knows these skills and you can learn them from. So hop to a completely different analogy. If you were trying to learn a skill like downhill skiing, I, th I kind of think this is fairly similar to learning test-driven development. I ha experienced this. Last winter, I, I realized that I'd done a lot of cross-country skiing, but I'd been putting my children in the normal ski school, and they were learning downhill skiing, and they were going to be faster than me. So I clearly needed to learn this too. So I got some skis, and I went up to the beginner slope, thought, right, okay, I'm going to learn downhill skiing. 
Okay, slope. I've done this before on cross-country skis. I'll just snow plow. That works. I can snow plow. So I, did, I went down the slope. Beautiful snow plow. Despite the skis being a bit of a funny shape, it seemed to work. And I got to the bottom of the slope. But then I realized snow plow doesn't scale. Um, if I want to go on really steep slopes and kind of, you know, whiz down them and, and have fun with downhill skiing, I need to learn what this guy's doing. I need to learn these parallel turns. And that is completely different. So I went back up to the, the beginner slope, to the top, and I stood there and thought, right, okay, no snow plow. I'm going to put my skis next to each other, and we're going to go down the slope, and we're going to swing like this and swing like this, and, and the wind in the hair and the swishing about, and it's going to be great. Oh. <laughs> Uh, two meters later, ugh, ugh, head in snowdrift instance uh, quite frequently. So suddenly that slope that was really easy with a technique I already knew was impossible <laughs> with the new technique. And it was just very quite a painful experience. So I think sometimes when you're trying to learn a new skill that's significantly different from what you know already, you can go through this, this period where it's just horrible, you, nothing works. <laughs> and uh, I think it can be like that with, with test-driven developments. You, you're used, you, you give someone a simple problem, a simple coding problem, they can solve it in the way they've already coded for, for years and years, no problem. Then you ask them to do it by writing the tests first, doing TDD, incremental developments. Ugh, nothing works, I can't do it. I feel like a, such a beginner, such a loser. Oh, I don't like this, I don't want to do this. Um, and you, it takes some um, perseverance to actually learn this skill. So this brings me to another sport. We're on, we're on karate now. Uh, this brings us to the coding dojo. So if you want to learn karate, you, you go to your local dojo and you train with other people who also want to learn karate. And over a period of weeks, you gradually get the hang of it. So the idea with the coding dojo is it's, it's a similar thing. It's a place you go with your, you get a bunch of programmers together and you practice programming. Maybe a group of about up to 15 people. You write code, you collaborate, you're discussing stuff and you're making it a place where you can, you can practice. And the point is you try and do this regularly, just like you go to your karate dojo every week. Um, you do this maybe every iteration, maybe every month, maybe when you have a major major release, you've got time for one of these. Um, and you practice skills in, a, in this dojo, which you can then use in your production code. And the point is, this is a, a safe environment where you can try stuff out, make mistakes, and it doesn't matter if you're having head in snowdrift instance every other, you know, every other move, because it's just toy code, you're practicing it on it, and it's okay to make mistakes. So it's really fun to get together a bunch of coders and just hack on stuff and do little problems. But I think if it's gonna be a, a coding dojo, you need to introduce a little bit more, more than just getting a bunch of coders together and hacking. I think you need to have an introduction and a retrospective. This is part of setting the, the, the boundaries and saying, right, we're, we've come into here, I'm introducing this for the group, we feel safe here, we're going to learn stuff. This is what you can expect to happen. And then the retrospective is where you, you think about what happened and try and think, well, how can I apply what I've learned to my production code situation? And of course, in the dojo, we have to write tests because we are trying to learn test-driven development and we have to show our working because TDD is, is otherwise this just becomes a code review and there, <laughs> Code reviews can be really boring. Um, but if you can show not only the code you come up with, but how you got there, then you can learn something about a way of working, a process. Uh, TDD is a process of developing code. And it helps if you can get someone to moderate or facilitate who's there purely to make sure learning is going to happen. And that is um, the essential elements of a coding dojo. And this is something that programmers can set up for themselves um, in the workplace as a way to learn a, a skill like test-driven development so that it can get across that chasm and change the industry. Um, another similar idea is the, uh, the code retreat. 
This is Cory Haynes. He has uh, come up with this idea that um, it's kind of similar to the coding dojo. You're getting together to practice and uh, learn test-driven developments. You're doing code carters, same as in a, a dojo. But it's a whole day event rather than just a, like a two, two hours that you can fit in more frequently. So you might do this maybe once a year or twice a year or something. Similar idea, though. Um, another thing I've come across is uh, craftsman swaps. So here we've got um, a few different craftsmen who they've all spent time going around uh, different companies purely to learn. Uh, so they, you, you either, they just do it for free because they, they want to learn and they'll just come to your company and code there for a week or two weeks for no money, maybe for food, um, because they want to learn. Or you could arrange a swap. I was uh, working for a company where they, they swapped craftsmen, so somebody flew over to the US for two weeks and they flew, and somebody from the US flew over here for two weeks and they did each other's jobs and uh, learned stuff about programming from other programmers. So I thought this was quite a, a cool idea, actually, that programming is, is a, something that you can learn by pairing with people from another company. And then, of course, when we say a community of professionals, there's hosts of online community events and, and stuff and open source projects and all this stuff. You can obviously get involved online with these things. But I, I think um, the point with the previous ones was they actually involve writing code. Uh, reading about code and reading code is good, but actually doing development is good, is maybe better. So that was community. The next part of the uh, manifesto for software craftsmanship is about stakeholders. We're, we're not having just collab collaborating with a customer. We're talking about, well, we're, we're partners here. We, we've it's more equal kind of relationship than we were thinking about our stakeholders. So productive partnerships, trust, long-term relationships, open and honest communication. These, this is uh, having a good relationship with someone, a good business relationship with uh, another company. So I like this quote by Laurent Bossevit. For a craftsman to starve is a failure He's supposed to earn a living at the craft. So the, this is the thing that craftsmen have to be pragmatic. They have a relationship with a customer. They have to deliver stuff and earn money. This, uh, this is uh, directly saying that we're not like artists. That, you know, Mozart starved to death, basically, when he was about 23. Um, but it's only after his death that we realize his greatness. For a craftsman, that is absolute failure. <laughs> you have to le earn a living writing software. You're not the, uh, the penniless artist. Um, you've got to have this good relationship with whoever is paying for your software. And I think there's more stakeholders than just the customer as well. There's the, the, the developer is, is in a network of people with different roles that they have to uh, understand the needs of not only the person paying this for the product ultimately, but all the other people that they have to work with and what their needs are. What does the architect need from this software? What, what does the um, database administrator need me to deliver so that I can have a productive partnership and good relationship with all the people in these roles? Um, I've got the UX designer there as well, even, so, as we heard. So I think that the craftsman really um, cares about relationships with, with the other, all the stakeholders. And this leads me on to the problem of requirements. The most costly problem in software is when you build the wrong thing. Beautiful chocolate teapot, anyone? <laughs> That's going to be useful. Um, so we solve this in Agile by, by having a couple of things. We have frequent deliveries. We, have, we deliver software every, every iteration. We, we have a time box. Oh, this, OK, this is. Maybe not Kanban, but the general idea is that we try and frequently push out a new version that real users can look at and comment on. And that helps a great deal, because if we built the wrong thing, 
hopefully will notice after one iteration. So that's one way we, we handle requirements um, in, in Agile, just by frequent delivery. But of course, it's all very well. You, c you can end up iterating quite a lot before you actually find what it is you're supposed to be building. So we have additional ways to work out what to build. Um, and when we talk about agile requirements, I like the description that Janet Gregory and, and uh, Lisa Crispin have in their book. User stories, we, we all heard about user stories. They've been discussed already. Um, they must come with a conversation. With uh, The user story itself is just a sentence. It's, it's worthless without the conversation with the stakeholder who wants the story. Um, the developer needs someone to talk to. And not just one person, probably others as well. But in that conversation, you come up with uh, usage scenarios. Uh, you come up with um, ideas about concrete examples, specification by example. We have uh, concrete stuff. And those things together uh, form the basis for what we know as requirements, so that we can, during an iteration, we can build the right thing, hopefully, and not have to just iterate week by week. So um, there are all these, you know, specification by example, BDD, ATG, that have come up since the Agile Manifesto. And this is a, a quote from Janet Gregory. Uh, Whether we choose to call it BDD or ATDD or specification by example, we want the same result, a shared common understanding of what is to be built to try and build the thing right the first time. So I don't think that there is any fundamental difference, really, between the three methods mentioned here. They're all about requirements. Understanding what the user wants so that we can deliver it and get paid. Um, software craftsmen earn a living. And uh, yes, I think we've, we've covered that a bit. So then the last uh, of the things in the Agile, the cro software craftsmanship manifesto is not just responding to change, but we're steadily adding value, the long view that this is, we, we expect our software to live long enough that we need to take the long view. So this is about having a design that can evolve for our system so that we can, we can continually refactor it to make it optimal for adding those new features. And for that to work, of course, we need comprehensive automated tests. I'm back on the tests again. These are important um, because they are what enables the system to live in the long term. This is what enables us to keep delivering value. Uh, if, we, if we don't have these tests, then the design will decay and the software will be unnecessarily complex. And eventually you get to the point where the software is so complex, and hard to understand, and you can't change it without breaking something. And you get this legacy code situation. So uh, this is a kind of a graph of uh, how this happens, really. Um, so your productivity as developers, as, as the, uh, the code descends into spaghetti, you find you can't do anything with it. It's, it's just horrible. Whereas if you manage to keep your code clean and you have some tests, maybe you're a bit less productive at the start uh, because you have to spend time investing in tests and stuff. But in the long term, you've, you've got your winning. You've got a system that you can keep building stuff. And I, this, all this um, pyramid that I of practices I mentioned earlier, that's, that's what you need to avoid getting that spaghetti, uh, basically. So uh, craftsmanship is definitely about putting the practice in place to be able to be in this game for the long term. And if that is going to be achieved, if you're going to put this stuff in place, in my opinion, um, you need the technical architecture, the continuous integration servers, the build servers, the, the, there's a bunch of technical problems that need solving. And you've got a team culture that needs to change. Programmers need to pay attention when the continuous integration server tells them that their code is broken. That there needs to be a culture of fixing stuff and, and craftsmanship culture, uh, pe taking pride in your work. But it's not enough just to have the t put the technical infrastructure in and check the team culture is all right. You have to have the skills to actually do this. If you're useless at, at design and you can't write tests for, for Toffee, then it's not going to help. So I think um, 
there's, there's a lot of things you need to put in place if you're going to get Agile to work or, or get this, this long-term software to work. So steadily adding value is actually a bit of a meta value. It's a, the long view here is, comes in in all of these. The well-crafted software is extended and reused in the long term. The community of professionals is about lifelong learning. And the profitable partnership, again, is for the long term. So I think a lot of uh, the reason about the, the software craftsmanship manifesto is saying, yeah, look, look for the long view of, of Agile and put stuff in place that means that you'll still be in business delivering software in a year or two years or five years. Don't just think one sprint ahead. So that was selling craftsmanship. I now have the unnecessary vanity part of the title because I've just uh, clearly said that I'm thoroughly in favor of craftsmanship, but I, I'm fortunately, I'm not joined in this opinion by everyone. And these three um, gentlemen here have all publicly criticized the software craftsmanship movement for various reasons. And these, these, are, these are our voices that I think are worth listening to. Dan North is inventor of behavior-driven development. He thinks that he, he's uh, been very critical of craftsmanship. David Harvey, uh, who's the CEO, CTO of Viclone and previously uh, other very uh, high-profile software companies, also very critical. Chris Matz, uh, one of the BDD um, people, uh, also well-respected. So what do they say about it that's so bad? I think you need to hear the other side of the story. Well, one criticism that comes up is that craftsmanship is anti-software engineering that you can either have software craftsmanship or software engineering. And this book by Pete McBreen is, is arguing for craftsmanship and dissing engineering, software engineering, um, you know, every page. Um, this is actually not a book I would recommend. <laughs> I wonder why. Because I think he's, 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 I don't like this argument at all. I don't think you have to choose. I think this is a totally false uh, division, a dichotomy between um, for me, I'm quite happy to call myself a software engineer. I think engineering is a very positive uh, way to think about making practical trade-offs and, and building something that works, which fits in well with craftsmanship. So I, I don't actually think that you have to reject software engineering in order to be a, a software craftsman. But there are some people who think you do, I guess. So the next argument that uh, gets put forward against craftsmanship is that it's, it's a bunch of developers huddling together in a room practicing stuff, ignoring the users. Um, and they'll, they'll get so kind of in, absorbed in, in the latest uh, technique for TDD or mocks or whatever it is that they'll forget to talk to the users. And again, I think this is a total misunderstanding. It's right there in the, the manifesto that we're interested in productive <laughs> partnerships with people paying for the software and people in the other roles. I think that's um, software craftsmen will, of course, go and talk to the people in the other roles. But they need to spend some time huddled together in the corner, learning some skills, so that they've got something to offer when they come out of the corner and, and talk to the other roles. So I think uh, the fact that they do these kind of dojos and stuff doesn't mean that they're ignoring the users. It just, you know, they need some time out from that to learn some stuff. Um, and of course, another, so another criticism that's raised is that this language, dojos and uh, apprenticeships, um, code carters, all this language is just getting in the way and making it obtuse. And of course, I've written a book called The Coding Dojo Handbook, so I have to be able to argue against this. Um, basically, I, I think words are important and words do have um, connotations that you might not expect. And when you start talking about craftsmen and guilds and you start thinking medieval, you start thinking um, oppression of women and um, apprentices who, who get beaten and that kind of thing. Um, but I think we're, we're making new meaning in these words. And whenever I talk about coding dojos, I talk about forums for learning. And when I talk about code carters, I talk about exercises. That's, they're just exercises, coding exercises. Um, and apprentice, uh, Craftsmanship is about professionalism. 
So I think you can put new meaning in these words. And it, and it makes, I think it's kind of cute, actually, to have these nice dojo and stuff, nice words. But people do think that these words are not, not appropriate. Then there's the, uh, the criticism that it is far too easy to become a software craftsman. All you have to do is go in, a few mouse clicks, sign the manifesto, and you are a software craftsman. It's even easier than becoming a certified scrum master. <laughs> so, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> But actually, I don't think this qualifies you. I think just signing the manifesto doesn't qualify to call yourself a software craftsman. I think people would mostly hope that you would have contributed to some open source project, or perhaps you've recorded a, a prepared carta showing yourself completing a coding exercise um, competently and put it up on the internet for everyone to see. Or maybe you've given a talk at a user group, or you know, there's, there's plenty of ways that you can show that you should be taken seriously as a craftsman. And just signing this is, is not sufficient. Um, another criticism that's raised that this is just an excuse, because developers love writing code, and they just want an excuse to go and gold plate and add a lot more code than is actually needed to solve the business problem. Um, this Dan North talks about, you, didn't, you don't want your plumber coming in to mend your bolt boiler and talking about the aesthetics of how he's arranging the pipes. You know, it's, you just want him to fix the boiler, you know. And th this is a, a criticism that uh, craftsmanship is encouraging us to add extra widgets and knobs and bells and making it look beautiful when this is unnecessary. And I think this is, um, it's always a danger with software developers that they go and spend time on stuff that's not needed. Um, but I think, um, emphasizing this thing of craftsmanship is not the same as being an artist. Software developers have failed if it looks beautiful but no one's using it. Uh, it's, uh, you've always got to be, have that pragmatic attitude that I'm building this for someone. And uh, that boiler does have to work, not just look beautiful. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think um, there may be more in this than some of the other criticisms, but still. Then there's the criticism that Craftsmanship is a moral crusade. Here we've got Bob Martin in his most scary mood saying, are you a professional? Uh, do you write tests? And uh, this can come across as being a bit kind of intimidating and like it's some cult or religion that you have to join. And uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think uh, really you've got to bear in mind that, that the point is not to be a member of the Craftsman Club. The point is to... Uh, outcompete everyone else because you're so much better at delivering software than everyone else. Uh, Bob Martin, I'm sure, is, is when he's wanting professionalism, he wants software developers to, to, be, um, to do good work and deliver stuff, not just be members of his, his club. Um, but yeah, I can see that from the outside it might look a bit like a cult. So I'm trying to, trying to not do that. But I think the, the biggest uh, question really put to software craftsmanship is what problem does it solve? That may, might need a slightly longer answer, and I, I think I'm, I'm coming down to this, really. Software developers in other parts of the world are a lot cheaper than software developers in Sweden. And I, I was had the privilege of actually visiting China. Um, I met a lot of really bright people, really good software developers who knew what they were doing and they really wanted to deliver something that would please um, the people who were telling them what to build. The culture was very hierarchical. That was, that was a definite difference compared with Sweden. But if you look at the raw skills of the developers, they are good. Um, and I can see why companies would want to use them and get, build their software there. But I think I also had another experience when I was in here in Sweden that I worked for a company which was had stuff outsourced to it from the US. So there was an international software company based in the US and they were outsourcing work to Sweden. Why would they do that? We're really expensive. Um, but actually, the quality that this company was producing, the productivity they achieved was such that it was really worth their while. They were, they were experts in this cutting edge technology, really productive with it. So I think 
Why do we need software craftsmanship? Well, I think it's the only way we're going to outcompete the rest of the world by being really, really good at developing software. And I see this as the future. You've got to take the long view. It's about long-term competitiveness. Um, the, the docks at Ericsburg are, are now totally rejuvenated, but I don't want to have to rejuvenate the software parks here in Gothenburg. I want there to be software being built here. So to summarize, the software craftsmanship manifesto is building on the Agile manifesto. It's concerned with excellence, community, end users, and the long view in everything to do with software. So I hope you feel inspired to pay a bit of attention to software craftsmanship and when you go back to your companies. And uh, I did promise that this wasn't a talk about uh, crafting furniture and, and glassware, but I thought maybe I'd slip a few in there. <laughs> Check if you're paying attention. So, questions? Jeffrey has a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um. I'm a little bit curious. I really enjoyed this idea of the coding dojo uh, on, on work time and uh, taking some time to focus on it because it tends to be something people do in their free time for interest mostly. Um, <coughs> and I also like the idea of the facilitator. Do, do you think to be effective with this, it's an idea that needs to come from the development team themselves? My question is me not being a developer. If I propose this to my team, is, is it your opinion that they're not going to be on board? Because if they're not on board, what kind of progress will we make? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. Are you gonna, is it going to work if you? I think um, it, attendance at a dojo, I, I really think, needs to be voluntary. The people need to want to be there. And you have to try and make it so much fun that people do want to be there. Uh, but I think you probably also need somebody who is a programmer to drive it. Uh, actually, and, and facilitate. I think it's hard for a non-programming facilitator. I've never seen that. I could be proved wrong. Frederick has a comment. So my, my suggestion then would be that you try, get them to try and experiment. We're going to do this thing once, and if you like it, you can continue doing it, and get a good facilitator, and they'll get hooked. Yeah, I wasn't planning to facilitate myself. That right. would be fairly crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the um, uh, I work a lot with requirements, uh, conventional as well as transforming uh, towards agile requirements, and you covered that really good. So I was thinking, um, for me, requirements is about craftsmanship, and you clearly see this as a bottleneck when people transfer towards agile, is that they don't understand what requirements are f from start with, right? And that's just being exposed, working agile faster. So do you see... Um, craftsmanship as a way of using the dojo technique even when it's not programming. I could foresee requirement dojos where you would actually work on typical requirement katas and you would have a workshop facilitator. Do you Have you thought uh, kind of like related domains kind of thinking? Yeah, yeah, I mean people have asked me that kind of thing before. You could do dojos on other job roles. Absolutely. Um, I, I attended a coaching dojo where we had, uh, we practiced coaching one another on our problems and and that was kind of cool. And I know that some people, I heard about an architecture dojo where somebody um, had architecture carters where you just draw lines and boxes instead of writing code, which I thought sounded a bit boring actually. But um, <laughs> I think absolutely, it, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, practicing stuff so that the, if you make mistakes, it doesn't affect your production environment. That's, that's got to be a good thing. So if you do something like that, um, let me know. I might come. I need to learn that. <laughs> I think this uh, boils down to like being proud of uh, what you do, and also being proud proud of discovering I didn't know this. Like it, katas is about it's about learning, it's about training, and if you want to be good at something, you need to do training, uh, and and training and that is mean like I simulate something that will make me better of what I want to be good at and uh, in what context does training 
or uh, training that simulates what you're doing every day not add value in terms of challenging well, yeah. your way of thinking and, and, and looking at it in different ways. And so it's, it's true, uh, but I think, I think the attitude is often that you, you did all your training at university, um, now you know how to code, get in there writing some code, production code, yeah. Uh, this idea that you might need to practice is something that is foreign for software developers, but if you're a pilot, they do loads of training, um, as well as flying planes. The people that win Olympics, they train a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sports <laughs> people train, musicians train, um, software developers are usually too busy writing production code. Um, and then they, they make all the mistakes in the production code. Uh, that's, there's got to be a good argument there for, for not making all your mistakes in the production code. Anyway, so I, I don't see any more questions, so I, I think we probably should uh, round up and go and find the food and the beer. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent plan. <laughs>